so many people in person here. It is the first uh, Alien Energy Astrophysics Division seminar of the 2023, end of the semester. Uh, let me remind you, this is organized by uh, and co-chaired by myself, Shu Rizao, and also Amy Gol and uh, Anna Trinidad de Falcao. Uh, so, um, one short announcement before we start. Uh, we are looking for uh, a speaker for uh, next uh, week, uh, and the first lot. So, if you are uh, uh, if you, uh, if you have a result uh, relatively recent uh, you would like to share, or if you are ready to accept to be volunteered, uh, that would be the right time to do it. Um, okay, and with this, uh, let me start the recording, uh, reminding people uh, connecting online that uh, if you don't want to uh, appear in the video, that is a good time to uh, shut down your camera. Okay, welcome everybody uh, to our first <laughs> seminar of High Energy Astrophysics of 2023. We have the great pleasure today uh, to uh, host uh, uh, Francis Halsen. Uh, uh, will, uh, let me introduce him. Uh, um, I try to be short, but the list uh, of achievement, achievement is still uh, relatively long. So Francis Halsen is uh, currently Villas and Gregory Brett Distinguished Professor, uh, professor of Physics uh, uh, Department uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, he's originally from, originally from Belgium. Uh, and he received his uh, master PhD degree from uh, uh, KU Leuven University in physics in 1972. Um, and he has been uh, uh, faculty at the physics department uh, since that time. Um, he was named in 2021 a Villas Research Professor, uh, one of the most uh, prestigious uh, um, honors of this university. Uh, he's also fellow of the American Physical Society since 1994. Uh, he was awarded a, a long list of uh, 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 prizes. Uh, let me just mention the 2015 Balsam Prize, the 2018 Bruno Ponte Prize, named after, after one of the um, originally um, uh, researchers who spent much of his time uh, trying to understand what neutrinos are. He was also one of the Panisperma. Panisperma uh, Street Boys, uh, the group led by Enrico Fermi, who named the particle neutrino. It was also recipient of the 2021 Bruno Rossi Prize and also of the 2021 Forni Baba Award. And he's also honorary doctor at several universities. Um, so Francis is probably most famous as a principal investigator of Ice Cube, a cubic kilometer neutrino telescope buried uh, in the Antarctic ice and South Pole. Uh, Ice Cube first observations of uh, uh, high energy cosmic neutrinos uh, garnered the 2013 Physics uh, World Breakthrough of the Year Award. Uh, also in September 2017, many of you might be aware of that, Ice Cube detected uh, a high energy neutrino from the direction of a blazer called KXS 0506 plus uh, 056. And this was the first ever evidence of a source of high energy cosmic rays, which uh, it's very hard to pinpoint because of the magnetic deflection. Um, he's also a skilled science communicator and uh, gives about 20 or more invited talks uh, uh, per year at conferences and workshops. Uh, and he's also a co author of uh, uh, Quarks and Leptons, a classic textbook on modern particle physics that continues to be used extensively for college campuses today. Um, he has, of course, a number of uh, large number of publications, uh, and uh, uh, he has uh, written and edited several other books. Um, today, we are very happy to have him here, and we talk about Ice Cube, high energy cosmic neutrinos, and uh, their uh, uh, their first sources. And with that, uh, Francis, I think uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Uh, it's a great opportunity for me to be able to present the latest ice cube results uh, to this audience. So you see the outline of the talk. I will introduce ice cube briefly, and then I will talk first about the diffuse neutrino flux that we observed in 2013, as you mentioned, and it contains two big surprises. We don't see our own galaxy, and uh, we find out that neutrinos are produced in very, very large, uh, with very large fluxes 
that point that they are produced in uh, sources that we actually don't see in gamma rays. Then I will talk uh, about the observation of the first sources, the excess is one of them. And uh, that, <clears throat> those observations actually confirm what we conclude from the diffuse flux. So, um, Ah, my screen doesn't move. I don't why it see. Ah, I'll do it this way. So uh, how do you make you neutrinos in the universe? You make them the same way as uh, you make them in a lab. You need a proton accelerator and you shoot the proton accelerator in a target, the target produces particles like pions and the pions decay into neutrinos. And that's how this happens in the sky. For instance, you could accelerate protons on the inflow onto supermassive black holes in active galaxies and the dense radiation and matter close to the black hole can represent the target for producing pions uh, that decay into neutrinos. As you will see in the rest of the talk, I don't choose this example by accident. Uh, the physics is all known since the 1950s, actually, when uh, a proton interacts with a gamma ray, produces a neutron and a pi plus, and the pi plus decays into neutrinos. Uh, let me showed it in a bit more detail here. Uh, you see the proton meets a gamma ray target, produces a pi plus, but it can also produce a pi zero. And uh, whereas the pi plus decays to muon and a neutrino, and then the muon decays in an electron and two more neutrinos, the pi zero decays into two gamma rays. And you see, we have two gamma rays for, uh, two muon neutrinos, uh, a neutrino and an anti-neutrino, and ice cube cannot tell these two apart. So what we expect to see is a gamma ray flux that's about the same as uh, the neutrino flux, and that's of course goes under the title of uh, gamma ray uh, multi-messenger astronomy. So here is one, picture introduction on how the detector works. It's one of the way it works, but the, probably the most important one. You see, uh, here where my pointers point, you are about uh, one and a half kilometers below the geographic South Pole. And so we have one instrument at one kilometer of ice with more than 5,000 10 inch photomultipliers and they form a Sherenkov detector. So the ice itself is the Sherenkov medium. And so to do astronomy, what we do typically <coughs> is uh, look only through the earth. So people, uh, particles that come through the earth are neutrinos, nothing else comes through the earth. And of course, it not only comes through the earth, it goes through your detector. But about one in a million times in the energy range where we are working, a neutrino will hit a nucleus in the eyes, a proton in a, in a water molecule. Uh, and when it hits the nucleus, it makes a neutrino. And so you see here uh, the muon traveling through the detector. Francis, sorry for interrupting. And, uh, Can you hear me? Hello, yes. Yes, yeah, sorry for interrupting. Yeah. Uh, your voice picks up a little bit. You mind to switch off the, the video? Maybe this can allow some more bandwidth. Uh, no. To switch off what? The, oh, the video uh, camera. If you okay. can switch off the, the camera. Uh, the camera. Uh, I don't see the camera anymore at the moment. Uh, <laughs> I should be on the. Okay. Bottom left. So the bottom uh, left of the zoom. Uh, uh, let me turn on technical to zoom again. Uh, 
Um, Yeah, I don't see. If you go to the Zoom window, uh, so that's the PowerPoint. But but you may, it may help if we stop sharing for a second. Yeah, I think I cannot turn off my uh, camera if I'm not sharing. I'll stop sharing. Now I can turn off the video. Okay, is that? Then, so now yes. I'll share now the screen yeah. again. Okay. Perfect, thank you so much. Okay, hope this works better. So as I said, you see, uh, it produces a mu on the neutrino that uh, travels at the speed of light through the detector. And uh, the radiation it emits, the Cherenkov radiation it emits uh, is picked up by the photomultipliers. And uh, you can see by eye the direction of this muon. We can reconstruct it to about 0.3 degrees at high energy. This is a, a movie of the event in case you didn't get it. So that's the muon traveling through the detector. So I'm going to first talk about the diffuse flux we discovered in 2013. And the most obvious thing was that uh, unlike in other wavelength of light, uh, we didn't see the nearby sources in our own galaxy. We saw an extragalactic flux. This extragalactic flux we, we have by now detected in many different ways. So let me first talk about uh, tracking muons coming through the Earth. You see, here is the number of events. This is nine and a half years of data as a function of the energy of uh, the neutrino. And you see here, uh, the threshold of the detector is about 100 GeV. The flux points uh, peaks at one TeV, and then it goes down, it decreases very fast. Those are neutrinos produced in the atmosphere, unfortunately, they are of no interest in this talk. But we see when we read about 10 to the 5 GeV, 100 TeV, you see we see an excess over the atmospheric flux which we measure and we can calculate. And that excess is the component our neutrinos re reaching us from beyond the atmosphere and beyond the solar system. Uh, they represent an extragalactic flux, and uh, we measure this flux in another way. You see this, if you look at the right-hand side of this slide, I can actually start the movie. Uh, so you see what happens when an electron or a tau neutrino interacts inside the detector. It makes an electron, for instance, and the electron will make an electromagnetic shower in the ice. And this ball of light you see is the radiation made by uh, this electron shower. So uh, we measure the electron and the tau flux also. And here you see a measurement of the flux. It corresponds to uh, energy flux, a flux of e to the minus 2.48 with some energy. Uh, about e to the minus 2.5. Now in this slide, I show the flux again from electron and tau neutrinos. And this is the flux of muon neutrinos that we measure uh, when uh, looking at uh, muon neutrinos coming through the Earth. So these are compatible. The muon flux is a bit uh, flatter, but in the end we see something, all the analysis we do find something close to e to the minus 2.5 and compatible with it. There are other ways. We have looked at tau neutrinos. We detected the Glashow event. The Glashow event by itself is interesting. Here you see it's a tau, uh, it's a, it's an event where an electron neutrino doesn't interact with a 
proton, but it interacts with an electron, an atomic electron, and it makes a real W, the weak intermediate boson of ATGF. And uh, so given that we know the cross-section for standard model cross-section, uh, we can calculate the flux that correspond to one event, and it's again compatible with the flux I showed on the previous slide. Uh, so here I show this flux again, but I show it in a very uh, unusual environment. You see what I show here is the extragalactic, the EBL, the extragalactic diffuse flux in light from radio to CMB, <sighs> going through different wavelengths to the visible X-rays. And here, of course, you know that uh, the one of the reasons for doing neutrino astronomy is that the universe at some point become obscure to gamma rays. And so the, this is the gamma ray flux that eventually gets absorbed in the microwave background. And it looks, the flux I showed you before, it looks like actually that like it exceeds the gamma ray flux, which is really surprising. So the flux of the photons accompanying the neutrinos uh, is higher than the flux observed here at lower energy by Fermi uh, NASA satellite. You can uh, make this argument a little bit uh, differently and in a more credible way. Here I show, uh, four different recent analysis of uh, this flux uh, besides the two I've already shown. So what I do is I take this flux, the neutrino flux, take the corresponding gamma ray flux, evolve it in the EBL, in the microwave background and other wavelength, and then I get the red fluxes. And you see the flux, this analysis, for instance, these two, they actually, the corresponding flux exceeds the flux observed by Sfermi, which confirmed what I showed you before. And of course, there is no problem with this. What it means is that the gamma rays that accompany the neutrinos uh, are already losing energy in the target that produces the neutrinos, and they come out at MeV energy or even below. So they, uh, we expect that uh, just from the diffuse measurement to see gamma ray obscured sources. I think this is a, a brief summary of what I just said, but uh, what it says, of course, it's a great uh, uh, opportunity to do totally novel astronomy. So where do these neutrinos come from? Uh, that was not an easy question to answer. and. Uh, so I'll give you a feeling why this is difficult. This is only one year of data, and every blue dot is a neutrino, as I already pointed out. They come from the atmosphere. We know from the measured diffuse flux. In, the, in that uh, map, there are about 200 cosmic neutrinos. Of these, we can see 12 because they have very high energy and are separated from the neutrino flux. Uh, but the others we have to find into this mess. And so, for instance, uh, here in the next slide, you see this is a five by five spot in the sky. You see the red dots are a source. I think that we injected, I think it corresponds to more than three sigma, but not much more. But you see, if I don't color the dots, you don't see this source. So we discovered, we developed uh, 15 years ago, a maximum likelihood technique that allows you in this map to look for clusters of uh, high energy neutrinos, typically higher than the diffuse background. After, uh, then the diffuse background from atmospheric neutrinos. After 10 years, we hadn't really found the source but we put these upper limits. These are sort of five sigma discovery for a source. But you see, there are four sources in this. We also look for a list of 110 sources. And there are four sources in this list that stick out. 
NGC 1068, TXS of 506, PKS 1424, and then this GB9 source. And so besides looking at this, searching this map, we, set, we search this pre-selected list of 110 sources, and you see here these four, these four sources sticking out. These, uh, their combined probability is actually over three sigma, even after taking all trials into account. But so the question really is, are these fluctuations or are these real uh, uh, sources? So what we had to do is to improve our detector after 10 years, and that's what we did to answer this question. So the first thing we did is we uh, recalibrated the detector, improved the geometry uh, of where every module is and which direction it's pointing. We calibrated every PMT individually and used it in the reconstruction of the events. Then, of course, in the last 10 years, we started using improved techniques to measure energy and pointing of the muon using machine learning. We improved the optics of the eyes. And very important, the point spread function in the direction of a neutrino, we approximated as a Gaussian. Now we know very well from the simulation, you can see this in these uh, plots here, that the Gaussian approximation isn't valid. And so we switched to an analysis where we used the right point spread function, which of course means that our telescope gained in sensitivity. And now I'm going to tell you the results of the reanalysis of the 10 years of data. We did exactly the same, but on the improved data set. Of course, we can apply these improvements to the whole history the, of uh, 10 years of ice cube data because we keep all our raw data on tape or, uh, origin, uh, or uh, now on, on disk. So here you see the sky map again. And again, the highest uh, the source is uh, close within 0.18. 0.18 degrees of NGC 1068. We find 81 events with a spectral index of 3.2. And the significance of this spot local is 5.3 sigma. Of course, when you correct for the searches to this map, uh, this, uh, uh, this probability gets spoiled by the number of trials. So then we do Again, an analysis where we look at 110 pre-selected sources, the same as in the previous analysis. We find again NGC 1068 with 79 events as the most uh, significant spot within 0.11 degrees of the real direction and uh, with a local significance of 5.2 sigma. Now here, there are only 110 trials so when we actually ask the question, how many trials will give this result accidentally, it requires more than 100,000 scrambles of the data. So even after correcting for trials, this is close to five sigma. So here you see the same spot again, but here you see the angular distribution of the background is flat, of course, and the uh, signal the 80 events, which are consistent with uh, the expectations from simulation. So uh, the other thing is that compared to the original analysis, by recalibrating the detector and proving the reconstruction, the source moved within the 68, the one sigma uh, pointing, and uh, you see the resolution became of the analysis became much better. So we did this analysis actually three times, once with a free spectral index, once with a spectral index of two, and here with 2.5. And you see, uh, these are the sources that appeared. And besides the source, uh, source appeared 
as the fourth source in this analysis, NGC 4151. The astronomers in the audience will, of course, rec recognize that NGC 1068 and 4151 were the sources observed by, um, by Seifert the, in 1943 paper that I show here. Uh, the second source in this list, you see T TXS of 506, that's a source we already knew about. It was uh, detected as a follow-up of this ice cube alert, the 300 TV neutrino, almost certainly cosmic, that pointed at this source with 0 0.06 degree precision. Uh, and that was uh, not only in the direction from TXS, but TXS was flaring at the time. Now, the accidental probability of this is, is uh, you know, three sigma, it's one in a thousand. But what followed afterwards is what made the source real, besides seeing it at more than three sigma in the time independent analysis I just described. And it was discovered to be coming from a TV blazar when magic looked at the source. In fact, 22 telescopes looked at the source, including a robotic optical telescope, Masters, who was on the source after 73 seconds. We sent the alert after 43 seconds. And uh, so the other meaningful uh, important fact here is, this is the multi-messenger publication, you can read about that. But looking at our archival data, now having a specific direction to look, we saw this in our previous nine and a half years of data. And you see here this huge flare. This is not a flare I've been talking about. This is the 2017 flare dominated by this one neutrino. This is a flare starting in 2014. And it's responsible for most of the flux of the source uh, in the last nine and a half years. It has an e to the minus 2.2 spectrum Eddington limit luminosity. And again, as already suggested by the diffuse flux, there are no gamma rays detected uh, on top of this flare. Uh, we can discuss whether any were actually discovered in 2017. Another interesting result that came afterwards, besides the ice cube result, is are the observations of this master optical telescope it actually detected an optical flare two hours after the neutrino. So the source went from off to on two hours after the neutrino was uh, detected. And you see the, the blue, green, blue spots here are the measurements master made on this source. And nothing happened to this source except the one flare starting two hours after the neutrino. They claim this has a significance of 50 sigma. Maybe something happened also at, uh, at our first flare, but that's less significant. But this uh, is an illustration how you can do multi-messenger astronomy in the time domain and get significance. So I think between uh, the many discoverings of TXS, this is probably undoubtedly our second real source beside NGC. Let me conclude by coming back to NGC and uh, show you the ice cube data and two models fitting it. And here you see the fact that also NGC uh, magic looks at the source and the gamma ray flux is like two orders of magnitude smaller, if anything, than the neutrino flux observed. So, it tells us that the neutrinos are produced in an active galaxy in a place where photons don't escape. And of course, this can only be in the region close to the black hole. Uh, so where you have the accretion, this means in the black holes, you have not a lot of opportunities to uh, accelerate protons and electrons, uh, but you accelerate them in what's uh, called the corona. Here is a 
simplified picture of this, which is known to be obscure to gamma rays and also has a very high density in matter. So you can actually produce the neutrinos on protons or on the gamma rays. One gives you neutrinos of 10 TV, the other gives you uh, neutrinos from 100 PV. But independently, if I calculate the density of this source, if I calculate the opacity of this source to protons, if I produce protons in this corona, the, proton, the opacity to protons uh, for interacting with the gamma rays is of course given by the X-ray flux in this case, uh, by the inverse of the radius, the smaller the radius of the, the bigger the flux. And so you see this, this number is 100. Uh, I worked this out for just spherical geometry. This is just dimensional analysis. And you can see that in for this to be of order one, <laughs> so that the protons produce neutrinos, are for the param for the flux measured from NGC 1068 cannot be much larger than 10 Schwarzschild radii. So neutrinos are produced really near the core of, of these active galaxies. Of course, if tau p gamma is one, the gamma gamma opacity of, is, is thousand times smaller. It's just the ratio of the cross sections with some kinematics. And so there's no way gamma rays can indeed come out. But the opacity to the protons is large enough to produce the neutrinos. So is this the answer to the neutrino source problem? And of course, as we are only looking at proton sources, is this the solution to the cosmic ray problem 100 years after their discovery? Well, you know, we now have a handful of sources that all have obscured cores and are natural places to produce uh, neutrinos, but uh, we don't know, we haven't proven that these sources make up our diffuse flux. They, there could be other sources. And so I conclude at this point, and the important conclusion for this uh, talk is actually that neutrino astronomy exists. We had no clue whether you could do neutrino astronomy with a kilometer cube detector when we build it. What's also clear from this talk that we need more neutrinos, we need more statistics, we need a better angular resolution. And that's happening. <clears throat> At the moment, there are plans to build neutrinos, two in the Pacific Ocean, and uh, one is under construction in Lake Baikal and one in the Mediterranean. So this is going to happen. And so that's the good news. And I think that the, the conclusion I want to leave you with is that after all this time, we probably, it looks like we have found a way to finally solve the cosmic ray problem with IceCube and with the forthcoming detectors. Uh, of course, IceCube itself will has plans to build a larger detector. Uh, I, of course, didn't do this work by myself. And I like to show you a picture of all the young people that produce most of the science I talked to you about today. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. Let's see if we have questions. Uh, uh, do, Amy, do you see any questions from the online uh, attendees? Um, I don't see any hands raised at the moment. We'll give um, a chance like to get to the person. I'm starting walking around with the questions here. Um, no, can you repeat the question or come closer? Yeah, can to you Al? repeat the question? I, I couldn't hear it. Um, so, I have a super cool question uh, regarding the scatter plot of the neutrino events that you showed in the Malvida projection. Uh, can you go back to that slide? Uh, yeah. 
Uh, I don't know if I can go back. I, my usual, ah, oh, yeah, I can. So, you want um, the, the the one before with the individual events without the points per function, I guess. The, this one. Um, no, I think the couple of slides before that. Okay. This one. Ah, oh, this one. Uh, yeah, but in the model, yes, yes, exactly this one. Um, this was from Ice Cube, right? Because, yeah. Uh, I mean, just 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 going by uh, association, but it looks a bit like there's some scanning strategy in the uh, like in the horizontal plane between north and south. Very Am I just imagining? Sure. <laughs> Thank I you. mean, it looks like W map, but I think W map has nothing to do no, with that. No, 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 no. You, you spotted it. Uh, I uh, didn't want to spend time on it. What you are seeing in this map is the horizon. Mm -hmm. Now, why do you see the horizon? If you go to, of course, what you are supposed to see, and what I said is you see, except you don't see this 200 cosmic events, you see a diffuse uh, flux, and you see the atmosphere, which is totally uniform. However, at the energies we are working, some of the neutrinos don't make it through the ice. And so neutrinos that reach us from the North Pole, they have the biggest chance of being absorbed in the Earth before they reach our detector. The cross-section has already a significant probability to to a, so that uh, it's large enough so that the neutrinos are produced. So the higher energy, the neutrino, the high energy neutrinos, they can only reach us from the atmosphere, from from the horizon. They don't make it through the Earth anymore, and that selection effect is what you see here. Uh, I see. Thank you. Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, so I, I have a related question. Uh, so, Mark, I, I guess you've actually answered it. So, uh, NGC 1068 is actually a declination near zero. And I guess the reason that that's sensitive is that's uh, right near the horizon uh, for your instrument. And so, you're especially sensitive to it. Um, yeah, and also TXS. So we have, uh, as uh, you know, the higher and the highest energy neutrinos, the highest energy part of this e to the minus two point five flux, as that's the best place to to look with little background. Uh, you know, we have the best sensitivity to sources near the horizon. That's a fact. Uh, I we have seen things that are not near the horizon, but they are embargoed by science at the moment. I cannot talk about it. So it's not like you only see the horizon, but that's the best place to look. By the way, something I totally avoided in this talk uh, is that when you look at this map, it has uh, at in in one year we also see a hundred billion cosmic. Uh, muons which we have to remove because a muon is a muon and so of course these are removed by uh mostly by looking through the earth but uh they, the flux is so large that it's still a challenge you have to reconstruct every muon correctly uh we have a raised hand from right now i don't know if we have time for it yeah we should probably oh. move to the other speaker sorry brandon you mind? No, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we are a little bit. Off. Yeah, you can. Okay. You can also send me emails if you want. I no problem. Yeah. yeah. Thank, you, thank Francis. you, Francis. Let's thank Francis again. Okay, let's move now to the second speaker of today. So um, we have uh, Sam Samuel Bellman. So he's, uh, uh, since last September, postdoc here at SAO, uh, working on the Parker Solar Probe, uh, solar wind electrons and alphas and protons uh, for short sweep team. 
So uh, Sam got his uh, master at the University of Oxford in UK in 2016. Then uh, he had some research internships in solar space plasma physics uh, at Trinity College Dublin and uh, UC Berkeley. Um, in 2022, uh, after his PhD, uh, oh, sorry, he got his PhD in 2022 at UC Berkeley um, at the Space Science Lab. Uh, he principally worked on data analysis and modeling support for the Parker Solar Probe electromagnetic field instrumentation uh, uh, for short fields, looking at the solar radio emissions and uh, the sun magnetic field. Uh, overall, he's interested in understanding the global structure of the extended atmosphere of the, the sun, both from observational and modeling perspective. And today he's talking to us about tracking a beam of electrons from the low solar corona into the interplanetary space with the low frequency array, Parker Solar Probe, and one EU spacecraft. Thanks a lot, Sam. Thank you. Uh, Thank Federico, you. Federico, sorry, before you start, did you want to change the video? It's currently still pointing at the audience. Ah, in fact, I think, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to do this just for the sake of band. Yeah, so uh, they're going to see. Have you seen the presentation, Amy, like this? Yeah, it looks good. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, sorry for the long title. This is um, the last project I completed in my PhD before I moved out here. Um, so it's not quite what I'm working on full time here at CFA, but um, I'll try and get to like how it kind of links together to what I do currently. Um, so this is a, a a project tracking a beam of electrons injected by the solar corona onto open planetary field lines, which is called a type three burst. And I'll get into exactly what that is. Um, this was published uh, in last fall at the DOI there. And if anyone has a QR scanner, you can get these slides from the QR code. I'll share that at the end too. Um, so you can just follow along or see what I said after. Um, so in like a broad brush stru um, structure, what we do in the study is uh, we use multiple instrumentation throughout the heliosphere and on planet Earth to track a single type three radio burst, which again, I'll explain more detail what that is. Um, so we follow it all the way from its injection at a solar um, active region, follow it along interplanetary magnetic field lines. And then last, we see a little bump in energetic electrons at one of the in-situ spacecraft uh, we have out in the heliosphere. Um, and so why this is interesting, so the second bullet point is a kind of more direct field, but um, types of radio bursts have a lot of interesting physics in them as to how they work um, and why they look the way they do. Um, but more relating to my current research, um, they're also interesting because we're tracking a beam of electrons, which is kind of a small uh, kind of a bump in the plasma distribution of the solar wind. So as it propagates, it's not changing anything in its environment. It's just passively tracing through structure. So what I kind of want to get out in the long term with this project is uh, using um, that kind of thing as a tracer for the structure over the whole uh, corona and heliosphere. So magnetic structure, density structure. So yeah. this is what a type three radio burst is. So um, type three, Visible no. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So a type two radio burst is um in kind of measurement terms a radio signature but it's caused by an energetic electron being injected at the sun, um, specifically onto open field lines. And so um, this beam usually comes out at a good fraction of the speed of light, 0.2 or so, not highly relativistic, but still quite energetic. Um, and so it, it travels away from the sun and um, as it moves, it interacts with the local plasma around it. And the kind of harmonic frequency around it is the local plasma frequency, um, which goes as the density of the plasma that it's traveling through. So as it escapes and goes away from the sun, you see the radio emission that it gives off dropping with time. Um, and that's basically telling you what density the electron beam was in when it emits those radio waves. So that gives you the um, the kind of experimental signature we see. So when we um, make a radio spectrogram, which is where we have time on the x-axis and frequency on the y-axis, so every column is a, is a spectrum. Um, then that uh, 
that makes basically a swish shape, like a, a sweep down in frequency from high frequency to low frequency in time. Um, and these are one of the brightest radio thing, radio um, radio uh, kind of uh, radio phenomena that you see at least um, at low frequencies. Um, but you see it continuously from up in gigahertz range, uh, where it's in the corona, um, all the way down to kilohertz, where it's reaching out to like carbon density around one AU. So the goal of this project is to track one of these bursts, and the obvious thing to do. Uh, is that we obviously have great um, tide array imaging capabilities in radio on Earth. But so the question is, why can't you just do that for these radio bursts the whole way out? And the issue is that we have the ionosphere um, around the Earth, which starts to basically reflect all the radio waves below about uh, 10 megahertz or so. So um, the frequency, uh, the local path of frequency of the heliosphere goes straight through that as you go from the corona to the heliosphere. So in the corona where you're up in like gigahertz plasma frequencies, those radio waves come straight through to us and we can see them from the ground. And so that's the first part of the study I'll show. But as soon as you're into interplanetary space, you don't have any access to those radio waves from the ground. So you have to use space-based implementation. So in this study, we use four different instruments. Um, so one is a ground-based radio observatory um, based in Europe called LOFAR. Um, and that can observe um, we observed it basically in the 10 to 90 megahertz range. And so that was how we got at the coronal um, location of the burst. But then to get out into interplanetary space, we use space-based radio spectrograms. Um, there were three specific I used in this project. So one is the wind spacecraft, which was launched in 94 or 95, and it's the Earth-Sun L1 point. Um, the other one at 1AU is Stereo A, and I'll get back to that because that's where the electrons basically end up from the beam. They basically arrive at Stereo at the end. And the third piece of the puzzle, and the reason that I'm funded at CFA, is Parker Solar Probe, which was a, a new NASA heliospheric mission uh, launched in 2018. And you can see its orbit is very different to everything else. It goes very close to the sun. Um, the instantaneous snapshot I'm showing you here is basically where these spacecraft were at the time of the burst that I'll show. Um, and the point I want to just make on this point, on this plot, is that all these spacecraft are several light minutes apart, which means that radio waves take different times to arrive at the different spacecraft. So that's kind of how we get away, from, get around the issue that we can't do imaging in space with radio waves. Yeah. So this is the uh, burst we studied in the red box on the bottom of the panel here. Um, you can see it's not like the brightest or most striking one for this day that we studied, um, but one, low far saw it. Two, uh, it's really well isolated. And as I'll show on the next slide, uh, by isolated, I mean it's not interacting with other beams. Um, whereas you can see the ones earlier in the day, there's a kind of a mess and you can't really tell one apart from the other. Um, and then three, we saw, we saw this burst in all four instruments that I just showed in the last slide. Um, we also have a good reason to suspect we know already what region on the sun caused the beam, um, because there's basically only one region of solar activity on the sun at the time. Um, Um, so this is the four spacecraft, sorry, the four instruments view of the of the burst. So um, LOFAR sees it at high frequencies, so 20 to 60 megahertz there. And you can see that you can follow it nicely from that instrument into the Parker Solar Probe measurements, where we shifted it in time to take account for the fact that the light waves arrive at PSP because it's closer to the sun, closer to the beam. And then the other two spacecraft out of what are you, they also see it. Um, you can see that the most recent spacecraft has the best time resolution. Um, come back to why time resolution is important. It basically limits the accuracy of what I end up doing. Um, so uh, you have to low there at the bottom, these three interplanetary spacecraft. Um, and so these are really far apart in the sphere, but they're all observing radio waves coming from the same point initially. Um, and then the other thing to point out is that there was no X-ray uh, flare related to this. So this wasn't an electron being injected by anything that caused X-rays. It must have been another kind of uh, X-ray quiet magnetic reorganization of the attribution that we look at. So there are three parts to the study. Uh, one is the coronal part where we're imaging it down the corona with LOFAR. And the second part is where we're using the fact that these spacecraft are multiple light minutes apart from each other to basically um, triangulate where the source is and how it's moving in planetary space. And then lastly, you get basically a single data point out at one of you when the electron beams are right at stereo. So this is what we get from LOFAR. Um, so 
uh, the middle plot there shows um, the solid disk with um, potential field magnetic field lines. Um, and then the centroids, which go from blue to green, are um, images of the radio source for this event. And from blue to green, you're going from higher to lower frequency. And what you see is that the burst is moving, um, the, sorry, this electron beam, the electron beam is moving up and away from the sun. And if we um, model the density of the corona, we can get the third dimension out of that. So that's just a 2D X and Y plane of the sky image. Um, but we can get a 3D position by, uh, by using a density model. And in that case, we can make basically this nice 3D visualization of how the source is moving. Um, and what we see when we do that is that it's coming from open magnetic field lines, as we expect the type 3 radio burst. Um, and those field lines map down really nicely to the uh, source actual region that we saw was the only one on the sun at the time. Um, so this is the kernel part. And as soon as you get much further out than this, your frequency goes below the ionosphere spheric cutoff, and you don't see any radio waves on the ground anymore. So that's where you have to turn to space-based instrumentation. So on the right-hand side, you can see the uh, bursts observed in our three space-based um, radio spectrum spectrograms. Um, and again, you can see straight by eye that they arrive, the burst arrives at all three spacecraft at different times. So what we do is we extract that arrival time in each spacecraft. Um, so we extract the first pixel that's above a certain um, a fraction above the background and for the smooth curve. And so what we get is a um, time of arrival as a function of frequency, which is basically a time of arrival as the burst is moving out into the heliosphere. Then if you combine each pair of spacecraft, you have a time delay, and that constrains the source to have come from a hyperbola, um, where a hyperbola is basically the mathematical locus of um, a path that has like equal path length difference. Um, so one pair of spacecraft gives you one of these hyperbole. If you have three, that's enough to intersect the hyperbole together, and that gives you a single source position. Um, in fact, you only need two hyperbole to get a position, but um, because we have an instrument resolution that we know, we can use that to kind of blur our measurements. And then that gives us like a thickness of the hyperbola and the intersection of all three of those then gives us an estimate of our error region. Um, and just to come back to the time resolution thing, the limit here is the fact that this spacecraft win, uh, we only have a timestamp every 60 seconds. So that basically puts our localization error at around a light minute, which is about 0.1 AU. So it's pretty big in the grand scheme of things. Um, but basically we can do this for every single frequency in the spectrum. Um, and so we can combine all that together. And so again, we get the same uh, kind of trajectory that we had in the low far image, but now we're seeing it in interplanetary space uh, where the yellow to purple is going from higher frequency to low frequency. And you see that as that occurs, the burst is moving outwards and the longer shoes that it's traveling out along is uh, consistent within point one AE. Again, it's not, the best accuracy, um, but with input one of you, it's consistent in longitude with, with the source actual region, and the red dots in the middle there are the low far image centroids that we just looked at. And then the last piece of the puzzle is that this trajectory here places us on the Parker spiral magnetic field lines, which go out to one of you. And if you follow them all the way out in the top right there, you see that they uh, intersect stereo, stereo ahead, which is again, we have in situ data for, for this time interval. So, um, this is the coronal interplanetary part, and now we're going to just look to see if there was any signature of these electrons surviving out to one of you. And the answer is that there's um, there's something. It's a very weak event by um, energetic in situ measurement standards. Um, but all I really want to point your attention to is the top left and uh, panel below that as well, um, which is the um, flux of 45 to 55 keV electrons measured at stereo A. Um, the burst we saw occurs just before the, the kind of gray shaded bar there. Um, so it's it's arriving at the, about the right time. Um, uh, the, it, it then gets a bit complicated if you look at like everything else going on in solar wind at the same time. Um, but um, so I'm happy to talk about that further, but, but um, I probably won't try to get into too much detail here, but basically the magnetic field at the location stereo is skewed about 90 degrees to where you expect it to be, um, which means that we kind of have to bend over backwards to draw a cartoon picture of how the electrons could access it, um, which is kind of the last plot of the study. Um, but basically, 
this was a, uh, we can tie this picture together with all the different um, plasma measurements from stereo A um, and basically conclude that there is a chance that we have this configuration of magnetic seal, which goes back in the end to the source region of the sun, um, which would allow us to get the electron beam that we see. Um, so that's probably the, the weakest part of the study is this final arrival at stereo head. Um, but overall, um, we had this nice multi-instrument study where we combined ground-based and space-based instrumentation to get around the fact that the radio wave signatures don't make it through to the to our Earth-based sensors at all frequencies. Um, at least the coronal part and the heliospheric part are like at consistent longitudes. Um, and so this is, a, I guess, a case study and where we want to go next with it is allowing um, is, is doing this for multiple um, multiple type three beds because these things happen all the time. And this is by no means like the brightest or furthest reaching. Um, one other thing I kind of stood on the rug is that to um, make that hyperbole intersection plot, I was assuming that the burst was located in the ecliptic plane, which um, is a limitation when you're working with three spacecraft. But actually since 2020, we have an additional spacecraft out in the biosphere called Solar Orbiter. And so we actually have the capability now to do this here with a four point measurement, which means that you don't have to assume that you can go and do it fully in 3D, where you're intersecting hyperboloids instead of hyperboloids. Um, so, um, so yeah, so I, um, the study is basically a proof of, the, proof of concept of the uh, techniques we use. Um, and so I want to be able to use this to actually like say that our trajectories that we derive are measurements of the magnetic field lines that the electron beams are traveling along, um, which is uh, has the potential to be quite powerful because we basically have no other way of measuring a single magnetic field line all the way from like zero to one AU. Um, so uh, that's kind of the goal of this work. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, um, thanks to use this microphone for questions from the audience in person. Do we have any questions? Yeah, there we go. Uh, uh, you talk about an electron beam back to the fairly narrow range of frequencies that are in the time being more like a bunch of electrons. Yeah. So keep this in mind. Why doesn't it just spread out? Um, I can't remember the exact physics behind it, but I believe it's the the most energetic because there's also velocity dispersion of the beam itself. I think the most energetic beams, part electrons lose energy fastest and they become they move into like the center of the beam. So um, I, I can write down the equations off the top of my head, but I think that people have shown it it works self consistently. So is it a uh, is it a, actually a current? Is it actually making the sun more positive? <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't think so. I think it's just that the electrons are way more mobile than any other species in the plasma, so they get ejected to high velocities. Um, there are some like recent Parker Solar Probe measurements where we see potentially beams of ions as well, and I don't think they've ever been seen before. But um, like. If, if you needed some ions to be traveling outwards from the sun as well, to like make charge balance, that might be a possible um, resolution. Um, you commented that the identification of the event at stereo was kind of the weakest part of the study. Um, I was wondering if you had other candidate events that you had in mind with more dramatic signatures at stereo, and uh, if you wanted to comment on the um, on the outlook for being able to make that with a few identification further events. Yeah, so the, so the most unambiguous signature in situ is Langley waves, because those are kind of the intermediate state between having the electron beam and having the radio waves generate. Um, so if you see Langley waves, which basically we see as kind of like vertical bars near the plasma frequency in the spectrogram, then that's pretty a clear signature that you have not just a beam of electrons, but also it's decaying actively into, uh, into other waves. Um, so those exist in the data set. Um, I'm not sure I've seen one in Parker Solar Probe yet, but there's also historical data from the stereo era. 
Excellent. Any questions? No questions? No. Okay, with the last question. Uh, I don't see any questions. All right. Okay, let's thank both of our speakers today. See you next week.